The Kaya Girl, a novel by Mamle Wolo, Chapter 3. I come from a small village close to Tolon, Faiza began. I was not born there, but when I was four years old, my parents gave me to my auntie, my father's sister, who lives there. They gave you to her, I interrupted. What for? For life, Faiza said simply. That is our tradition. I did not really understand, but I wanted her to continue the story, so I kept quiet. My auntie had her own children and I help her look after the little ones. And I help her with everything else, cooking, cleaning, washing, trading, farming. When her children went to school, I stayed behind, doing all that work. Sometimes, when they came back from school, they would sing A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And they would count one, two, three. And I learned some of it and wanted to learn more. But I knew Auntie would never send me to school. My cousin Asana was my best friend in that house. And sometimes, she would open her exercise books and show me what they had learned in school. One day, Asana came looking for me in tears because her parents had just told her not to go back to school. They wanted to marry her to a rich man. He was one of her father's friends except that he was older than her father. I knew that man. His mouth was full of gaps and the teeth left were brown from chewing cola nuts. He already had three wives. He was quick tempered, but everyone admired him because he owned the village corn mill and a tractor. It was the only one in the village. When Asana protested, her father asked if she was mad. She did not know what to fear more, her father's anger or marry to Alhaji Brown Teeth. Alhaji Brown Teeth, I giggled. Trust you, Faiza. That was what we called him, Asana and I. Asana got a headache every time we talked about him. And she said the idea of getting close to him made her stomach hurt as well. Poor thing, I said, genuinely heart sick for this cousin of my friend whom I had never met. How awful to be forced to marry a large brown teeth. Well, that wasn't the only problem. How do you mean? You see? There was this boy she liked already. Ah, I said conspiratorial. And what was he like? Oh, he was so cute. He had dimples and he was always joking around. All the girls liked him in the school. But she was the one he liked, right? I asked, somehow sensing the flu. You know it. You see, my cousin was so pretty and she giggled a lot, just like you, actually. Like me, I asked, feeling like I was learning something new about myself. Yes, like you, Pfizer said with one of her oversized smiles. And like him, they just understood each other. Excellent, I said, enjoying the story 
and then remembering it was a sad one. So what happened? Well, she had hoped that once she finished school, Malik might ask for her hand in marriage. But now all her dreams were shattered. Malik was still in school, still surrounded by girls who liked him, and she was faced with becoming the fourth wife of Al Haji Brown Teeth. She cried day and night, but it did nothing to soften her father's heart. She was not the first young woman in the household that he had married off. What about her mother? In our village, a woman cannot tell a man what to do. Auntie scolded her and told her to stop crying and be strong, that she was not a child anymore. She knew they would get a rich dowry and that her husband had been praying for Alaji's eye to fall on Asana, but I knew it was her daughter's misery that had tightened the corners of her mouth. Asana was a twin. That was why she had not been given to her father's sister as a child. Unlike many of us, she was raised by her own mother. So they were close. But her twin sister had died when they were small. Sometimes she used to tell me I was like her sister. Come back to her. As soon as Alaji sent the initial collar to her parents, Asana became like a prisoner. The adults in the household hardly allowed her out of their sight. They were impatient for brown teeth to come and take her away so that they would not have to worry any longer about anything happening to jeopardize the marriage and so that they could all enjoy the dowry he brought. She felt so hurt and abandoned. She used to just sit in the room staring at the wall. Then she would lie on her mat as if she was asleep, but she wasn't asleep. She had cried all the tears she had. So she was just lying quietly, trying to wish herself away from there. So when did the wedding take place? Habba, Faiza exclaimed smiling and then she said carefully and mischievously in English, exercise patience. I had to smile too. It was so funny, but at the same time, so perfectly correct. So typical of her. She picked up the story. Alaji had traveled to Mecca for the Hajj and wanted the marriage to take place as soon as he got back. That was even why he wanted to take a new wife to celebrate his return and is officially becoming an al -Hajji the first in the village. Auntie tried to cheer Asana by telling her that he would bring back beautiful things for her from Saudi Arabia. But it only made Asana clutch her stomach and turn away. She told me she felt like a cow being fattened for the feast. The wedding was to take place a day after Elijah's return. The Imam would bless him as an al -Hajj and then perform the merry rite straight after so there would be a double celebration. The day he returned, the whole village was astir. When I got home from the stream that evening, Ante was not there. She had gone to her sister's house to borrow some jewel for the festivities the next day. Her finest cloth, the one I loved with glinting gold threads woven into the pattern, was hanging on the line outside to her. On the line outside, uncle's room on the other side of the compound were three batakari. 
He would wear all of them tomorrow with the smallest, sleeveless one on the inside and the largest, longest one on the outside to make him look big and important. It had intricate embroidery on the front and back and the matching trousers hung next to it. I had never seen him wear that batakari before. The whole compound was busy. It seemed as if all the women of the household were cooking, for even after the bride was gone, visitors would come to congratulate her proud parent. Anka's second wife and two other women were pounding dried corn for the tuzave in the mortar outside Anka's room. They were singing along to the rhythm of their alternating pistols, making up a song about the wedding and laughing at each other's contributions. Some rather rude. Uncle's sister was busy over the outside heath, making soup in an enormous black pot and shaking her head at their song. A smile on her face. She called me over impatiently and held me down with a heavy headband. What took you so long? She asked impatiently, using an empty tin to slush water from my pan into her bucket. I, uh, I tripped and fell on the way home and had to go back for more water. I told her trying to dry my face and neck with a corner of my wet rubber. As I went inside, I wondered how Asana must be feeling hearing all the preparations and the song of the maize pounders. I found her holding a knife and staring intently at the sharp edge as if in a trance. She did not even hear me till I was right in front of her. What are you doing? I asked in fright. She jumped startled. Then she put both hands over her face and for the first time in days, tears ran down her cheeks again. Oh, Pfizer, she said in a cracked voice. There is no other way out for me. Stop it, I said, grabbing the knife from her and returning it to the basket in which Auntie kept her cooking utensils. How can you even think about such a thing? If you were me, you would think about it too, she said. I held her and she cried and cried and I cried too. Then I stopped and said, it is not the only way out. Asana, there is another way to run away. Faiza, if that were possible, I would have done it already. But you know how many people are out there and how they have been watching me. I will help you, I said. When I was at the stream fetching water today, a group of girls were talking about their plan to run away and become Kayayi in the big city market. That is why I was late getting back. What? Asana asks, her eyes becoming huge. Yes, they have been planning it for a while and they leave at dawn tomorrow to catch the early bus down south. They are hoping that with all the excitement about the wedding, it will take people a while to realize they are missing. Leaving at dawn, Asana echoed. It seemed to be the only thing she had heard. Yes, I whispered. They would not even have told me, but Rakia is part of the group, and she could not keep a secret from me, so they made me swear not to tell. Rakia, your best friend? She's leaving? Asana was incredulous. But she's no older than you. Oh, some in the group are even younger than her. 
You know how everybody wants to go these days? Rakia has been dreaming of it ever since she saw the things the retainees brought with them when they came back this year for the granite harvest. She has been going on about English bows ever since. I have to interrupt Pfizer's story now because curiosity was getting the better of me. Retainees? English bows? I had to know what she was talking about. Okay, she said patiently. Let me explain a few things to you. I am not the only Kayayo from my village. Every year, many of the young girls leave for the market of Kumasi and Accra. Why? I asked. Well, they feel they will have a better life that way. Many of them are with their aunties, so they know they will never go to school. And even those in school, you know these village schools, who I guess you don't. But anyway, those schools cannot help them be anything in the future. So some of them convince their families to let them go so they can earn some money and others just run away without telling anyone. Some come back for the granite harvest every year to make some money back home and also to show everybody all the fancy things they've bought in the city. Like English bows? What on earth are those? You know those cooking pot decorated with bright colors and patterns? Yes, the ones that come in stacks of different sizes. Exactly, those are what we call English bows. Oh, so what do the girls want them for? Faiza smiled at my puzzlement. Where I come from, Women have to collect cooking pots and utensils and serving bowls and plates in preparation for marriage, she said. For marriage, I echoed in surprise. But you said some of those girls were younger than you. I know, explained Pfizer patiently. But in the village, we marry young and the girls like to start preparing as early as possible so that they will have a good collection by the time they get married and they continue adding to them after marriage wow i exclaim what do they need so many pots and pans for well in your home when your mother cooks it's probably only for five or six people right my mother never did the cooking but I knew that was not the point, so I nodded. Even fewer. Pfizer continued. In my village, a woman may have to cook for up to 50 people at a time. When it is her turn to cook, she cooks for the entire household and with all the different wives and their children and the other relatives that comes to a lot of people. Wow, I said again. No wonder you aunt needs a helper. Oh yes, she said. It's a lot of work, you can imagine. So does your auntie have a lot of bows? I asked. I wish you could see them, she exclaimed. So many sets, and they are all stacked neatly on a table. Some as high as the ceiling. I try to visualize walking into someone's room and seeing in the pride of place of all things a towering display of flowery pots and pans. I realized that I actually wanted to see them. I actually wanted to go to Pfizer's home and see all the things she was telling me about. I pictured Aunt Lydia's reaction on hearing that I wanted to go up north. 
It sounds like your auntie is very proud of her collection, I said. Oh yes, back home, that is a woman's pride. So they all try to get the best collections. That's why the young girls struggle to work and buy them. So have you started your collection? I asked Sly. She smiled with eyelids lowered. Not yet, but when I am able to save enough money, I will. Are you looking forward to getting married? Oh no, she said, not yet. But getting my paws in pants is just something I have to do. I understood what she meant. It was like getting something that everyone else in your class had or passing an important exam. Just one of those things you had to do, whether it made sense or not. No, getting married is not something I can imagine for myself right now, Pfizer continued, especially after what Asana went through. Oh yes, Asana, I said, impatient to get back to the story. So what happened next? At that moment, I realized that an important looking customer was standing before us with her hands on her hips. I usually saw the customers before they got that far and made sure we cleared the doorway. But this time, I had been so engrossed in Pfizer's story that I had not spotted her. Flustered, we both jumped out of her way. End of chapter 3 Please Kindly watch chapter 4 in the next video. Thanks for watching. Please like our videos, subscribe, hit the bell for more exciting videos. Thank you.